Thank you so much for coming. My name is Alex Dunlap. I'm the general manager for AWS Elemental, uh, which is a uh, suite of AWS's solutions for media entertainment. Um, I wanted to kick things off here, do a couple of slides, uh, and take you through kind of the agenda and the setup for um, you know, why I'm excited to be here and why um, I think you're going to learn a lot uh, about media and entertainment and uh, technology and what AWS is doing in the space. Um, first off, one of the great things about AWS is the depth and breadth of partner solutions uh, that we have um, building on AWS. Uh, that's uh, absolutely true in the media and entertainment space. Uh, so wanted to start out with a big thank you to all of the partner companies who have sponsored this event. Uh, you can go out into the hall here and um, uh, check out uh, tables, uh, learn more about their solutions and how they uh, interact with AWS products. Uh, really great selection of partners um, that make AWS, one of, the, one of the reasons that make AWS uh, a great place to build uh, media work, workflows. Uh, so the agenda for today, um, this is the business track. Um, I'm not going to be able to read this uh, super well, but there we go. Um, so uh, this is the business track. There's also a technical track. Um, someone just asked me, is it OK if I bounce back and forth between the two? That's totally fine. Um, there is not a bold line between business and technical concepts in, in, in this space. So um, we would welcome you to, to go back and forth based on your interest. Uh, so we're going to start out um, with a, a state of media and what's new from uh, AWS. So that's going to run from 10 to 10.45. Uh, uh, Steph from CBS is going to come out and talk about how they are doing live events uh, at scale on AWS. Um, talking about doing content, uh, uh, content animation, uh, so tangent animation, um, uh, created the movie Next Gen on AWS, and so they'll be going through kind of the content production rendering workflows that they're doing. Um, one of the values that you, at least I, I tend to hear customers from events like this, is talking to each other. It's great to uh, see presentations about what the AWS services are doing and what partner solutions are doing, but it's also great to hear from your peers as to trends, um, you know, what are you doing in AWS? What am I doing? How does it compare? So there will be a couple of opportunities to network, uh, first at a lunch and then uh, at a happy hour in, in the evening. Um, afternoon will be machine learning and post-production. Uh, and then finally, uh, a AI and ML. Um, and then we'll end up with a, a, a presentation around uh, a virtual weather person and uh, innovation in the partner ecosystem. So it's a good, uh, good series of topics uh, talking about how the cloud is really transforming uh, media workflows. So I, um, I, this is the way I look at this. This is a very exciting time to be uh, in the media space. And um, it's, it's also a little scary. If you look at a traditional uh, sort of media value chain, um, you had rice holders or studios who would give uh, content to broadcast channels uh, who would give content to distributors, who would give it to the viewer. And it was very linear. Uh, so you basically, if you were a player in, in this value chain, you needed to worry about the party to your left and the party to your right. Um, and um, it, w it was very linear, but it was also brittle. And uh, the interesting thing happened, which is technology came along, and it's changed all of that. So the way we look at it now, the whole industry is reorienting around the viewer. Viewers can get the same piece of content from a rights holder directly in a direct-to-consumer model, from a uh, channel, uh, a, 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 maybe a, a um, TV Everywhere application or another um, sort of, um, I think it's a good example. Um, or from a, from a uh, traditional distributor. And they're making their decision based on features. They're making decisions based on quality. They're making decisions based on reliability. 
They're making decisions based on personalization, uh, the ability to watch what you want, where you want, whenever you want. And this is the expectation. And we believe that the um, companies who do well in this space will be the ones who give their viewers that best experience. Now, from our perspective, there's a great fit with what it's going to take to succeed for the viewer and the benefits of what you get running in AWS. Um, we give uh, media companies, whether you're a rights holder or a, a network or a uh, distributor, the ability to give high quality media solutions um, that let you be nimble. You can try new things. You don't have to spend uh, upfront capital in order to adopt the newest technology. We provide the scalability so that you can scale up to the world's biggest audiences, um, but also scale down so you don't spend money when you don't, don't have an audience. Um, we provide the best video quality around so your customers get a, bit, a great picture, um, really a great video core, kind of core video experience. Um, and we provide the be uh, a, a great platform to build reliable video um, workflows, uh, things that are going to work for the highest value content um, without questions of reliability. So the things that make the industry uh, challenging I really line up directly against the benefits of the cloud. Uh, and that's why we think um, so many of you are here. Uh, and um, why we think AWS is a great place to build video workflows. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Aaron. Aaron Tunnel is our um, uh, business development manager for um, media and entertainment. He's going to take us through uh, a series of slides on trends in the industry and what, uh, what AWS is doing in the space. So Yeah, I, I, great to be here this morning. <clears throat> um, I think... Um, you know, this Bob Iger quote, I think, is a uh, is, uh, guiding light for a lot of us in this room. You know, uh, as Alex mentioned, we're really thinking about the customer first. You know, uh, I think it's a very Amazonian topic. I think Amazon always tries to work back from the customer. But it's exciting times for us. While there's a lot of change going on in the industry, um, really by focusing on the customer first, focusing on the cu customer experience, making a rich customer experience, you know, I think... Um, you know, we're really going to be able to enable for customers you know, from that perspective. So while many folks have been arguing whether it's distribution or content that's necessarily king, at the end of the day, it's a customer that has really kind of established themselves as king, right? So, uh, you know, like I said, focusing on customer obsession, focusing on the customer first, and then using um, the customer to, to help drive our business you know, from that perspective. And I think we'll tie into this a little bit uh, later in, in this morning's conversation as we really kind of focus on machine learning, recommendations, personalization, and how we can really focus on the customer you know, with some of the solutions that we're, uh, we have here at AWS. And in terms of AWS, why do we feel that we are the best platform for, to partner with um, you folks in the room here? Um, you know, we have the global scale. We have the agility. We have the depth and breadth of services, both first party and partner from that perspective. Um, and the workloads that we're really focused on that you, the customer, are telling us you need help with are things like end-to-end -end video. So that's a lot where Elemental fits in the picture with things like video on demand, uh, OTT streaming, um, but also things like linear cloud playout. Like, you know, we, we've seen uh, some of our customers, you know, um, uh, really pioneer here in the last couple of years from that perspective. You know, machine learning and analytics, this was a topic that we really thought previously was an accelerator or an overlay on a lot of these workloads. That's still, I think, very true, but our customers, you all in the audience here, are telling us that this is really top of mind for you uh, moving forward. You know, how can you use machine learning to either simplify your business um, and find agility there, or secondarily, um, drive a great customer experience you know, from, um, by using analytics? Um, and really, analytics and machine learning come together as, as one real topic, and they feed off each other from that perspective. Um, asset management archive, um, we'll, we'll touch on this as well, but obviously using machine learning to, to add value to your, your media archives and uh, some solutions that we have to help you guys bring those archives to the cloud and find additional value there um, uh, by doing so. And last but not least, 
um, content production. You know, this is things like rendering in the cloud, but we're also very much um, getting uh, deeper into virtual workstations for both visual effects and editing. And particularly if you're in sports or news uh, or working with a global team and need to be able to share content, produce content at a global scale anywhere in the world, you know, I think that um, finding agility here is also uh, going to be super important to, to your business. Um, in terms of how we can help you guys build, <coughs> we've got uh, obviously our native um, infrastructure products, um, and, and you can choose to essentially you know, build from the ground up on top of those, and, and we've got some great customer use cases where they've, they've literally started at, at the bottom and worked their way up. Uh, we've got a number of great partners. Some of them are, are uh, out in the hallway, and we'd love for you to visit with them uh, later today. Um, but we're really enriched by our partner solutions. Some of these folks are born in the cloud. Some of these folks are, have been around for decades and are, and are pivoting towards the cloud. And, and there's probably a solution uh, amongst all of them that's right for you. And finally, you know, truly managed services, where it's kind of a combination of the two. You know, we've got some great consulting partners, great partners that can help us um, you know, build on top of AWS, but help manage and, and run some of these solutions from an operational perspective along the way as well. What we see is this is not a uh, or. Um, lots of customers will use a combination of all four of these uh, uh, models in order to build their video workloads. So it's not, we very deliberately have tried to build primitives that work well together uh, and that work well with partner solutions and that can be built into a managed solution. So uh, we see lots of customers in the media space um, using a combination of uh, work, uh, workloads that use a combination of native, partner, managed, and our media solutions together. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's talk about some of the new services we've launched here uh, in the last couple months um, or, or, or since reInvent from that perspective. And um, many of you may have gotten this message, but we also find as we talk with customers that you know, the pace of innovation at, at uh, AWS um, it's hard to keep up with the latest trends or, or really where some of these services fit into the business challenges that you guys have today. So one of the ones I'm most excited about, Elemental Media Connect. Um, this is essentially an, an on-demand, point-to-point IP transfer service. It's a great fit to supplement or replace satellite or fiber-based point-to-point distribution. Um, single input, multi-fan out, so that you can use it to distribute to multiple different partners or locations from a single input. Um, and it's, again, all on demand, so um, there's no reoccurring costs, whether you guys are using this linearly uh, every day or whether it's uh, standing it up you know, for individual events from that perspective, um, you're only going to pay for what you use from that perspective. Um, Alex, a, why don't you tell us a, yeah. a little bit more about the service? So um, I'll do a customer example. Um, we had a customer right after launch. Uh, we, we announced it at uh, reInvent, and then um, like the next weekend, we uh, got a notice that a customer was doing a big eSports event. And what they wanted to do was to reliably get um, you know, gaming content, eSports content, from a venue into the um, uh, Oregon region, the AWS region in Oregon. Uh, they then would send it to um, Media Live, sort of our encoders, uh, in uh, London, I think it was London, it might have been, Dub sorry, Dublin, uh, Asia, uh, somewhere in Asia, I forget the specific regions, um, uh, where it would be personalized and then delivered to, uh, or localized, I guess I should say, and then delivered to audiences there. So they were using Media Connect in, in two ways. Uh, one is reliable ingest into AWS, so that first mile from the venue into the Oregon uh, region. Then they were um, using its replication uh, functionality to send uh, video, live video to uh, other AWS regions for uh, downstream processing, in this case localization. Uh, they wanted to do that in a very reliable fashion, uh, so they took advantage of our uh, supports in the, in the protocols to, to ensure uh, reliable live video. Um, and from an event perspective, it was great because they could turn it on and then turn it off. And at the end of the event, during the event, it, it ran flawlessly. And at the end of the event, their bill went back to zero. But it's also a good use case uh, around, say, uh, linear, whether it's linear cloud playout or uh, some sort of um, you know, always on OTT stream. Maybe it's uh, it's your OTT channel that you know supplements your, your news or your sports or whatever the content is you guys are distributing from that perspective. So um, whether it's on the input side and we're trying to backhaul signals from, say, a stadium or a live event, or you're using on the distribution side and handing off various different flavors using the fan-out functionality to multiple different partners or MVPDs, you know, 
uh, we think that it's going to be a pretty flexible service for you folks uh, to take advantage of. Um, some of our other services that we've announced recently, Glacier Deep Archive. So many of the folks in this room are, are using our object-based storage, S3 and Glacier, uh, for, for kind of uh, hot and cold data from that perspective. But as we continue to help many of you in, um, think about how to retire your LTO archives, how to ensure that you've got you know, redundancy um, in the cloud for those crown jewels, those media archives, um, and being able to put them in various different regions to meet you know, the SLAs that you guys have in, in terms of where content should go. Um, you know, there's been challenges around you know, where should we put stuff, how should we tier it, you know, what, are, what are the overall costs of, of long-term storage in AWS. And I think Glacier Deep Archive, it's about a uh, dollar, a terabyte a month. You know, we've, we've really kind of gone pretty aggressive uh, on the cost side and really feel that this is gonna be a good fit for a lot of customers um, for long-term archival storage uh, from that perspective. Um, now, unlike uh, the, the normal tier of Glacier, we do, do not offer a rapid restore today uh, with Glacier Deep Archive. So particularly if you're in news or sports and you need the capability of being able to go back to this quickly, um, we're really happy to deep dive with you folks around what's the right mix of, say, S3, Glacier, uh, and Glacier Deep Archive in terms of where data should be tiered so that the hot data is available when you need it and the stuff that's truly an archive uh, is at the right tier at the right time from that perspective. So. And I think this really ties into a, a conversation we're having with a lot of customers around the, con um, the idea of a, of a content lake. So everyone today, especially as we're, we're um, going down this road of direct-to-consumer and the shift to direct-to-consumer, you guys are building a much closer relationship with your end customer and you're learning a lot about that end customer. What are they watching? Where are they watching it? How are they watching it? You know, what, what kind of content resonates with various different demographics? Um, and so you're, you're storing this in data lakes today. And then as we bring the actual media assets into the cloud for, for, um, for long-term archive and, and near-term uh, distribution and use, um, you know, those, those assets are sitting in S3 and Glacier. And you know, historically, you know, we can certainly run either a hybrid fashion or all in on the cloud, you know, asset management platform. You know, many of the partners that we have here today you know, are, are able to deploy their asset management platforms in the cloud. But we're really thinking about now the, the, the total view of that media content in the sense that we have both how it was produced and maybe the rights around it of the content that was typically stored you know, with tags and some sort of asset management system. And now we have the full view of how consumers uh, um, viewed it and where they viewed it and how they viewed it, being able to have a, a kind of one single lake and one single view into all that content and how, you know, what the life cycle of that content was, not just in terms of where it was distributed, but who watched it and how and whatnot here. So we feel like between machine learning and analytics, our storage platforms, um, and being able to move data real time in and out of the cloud, that this idea of a content lake is a great fit for a lot of customers um, today. And secondarily, the AWS is a great fit to, to trust that data with us. And I think Glacier Deep Archive fits really well into that story as well. In terms of storage, we're not just thinking about archival storage. We're also thinking about high performance shared storage. So we have released uh, EFS, our Elastic File System, which is primarily uh, designed for Linux-based systems, and a lot of customers are, are continually asking us, but what about Windows? We have um, visual effects and video editing workloads that run on Windows today, and we want to be able to have a high-performance shared storage for those workloads. Um, so we, uh, we announced uh, Amazon FSx, which is a high-performance uh, Windows shared file system. Um, it fits into all of the Windows permissions uh, and Active Directory infrastructure that you guys are running today so that you can manage users on the platform and manage the per permissions um, of the content on the platform very efficiently. Um, but we also are now allowing you to bring things like editing work workloads, whether it be uh, Adobe Premiere, Avid Media Composer, um, 3D uh, content creation software like you know, Soft Image or Maya or 3D Studio Max or, or, or whatever that may be, and having that shared storage so that whether those users are in the same city, whether those users are in the same uh, country or even globally would have collaboration and access to this high performance storage and then as content is being finished, um, then we start handing it back over to things like S3 and Glacier for 
for distribution and long-term archive of, of those finished assets. So particularly if you're you know, in, in the sports world or in the news world and you're following the next election on the road or whether you're um, going overseas to help you know, with the Olympic production, we're th seeing things like you know, the shared performance storage you know, being uh, great use to folks who want to send less people overseas but still want to have that shared collaborative environment where they're you know, having people both um, on site and, and uh, back at the office, uh, the home office, um, or even the actual home office or a coffee shop, uh, I'll be able to collaborate on those media. Um, and then things like elemental you know, media connect, like we mentioned earlier, in terms of getting, say, those live linear feeds back from some of those events as well, so that you know, if they wanted to go live the air you know, with those feeds, that that be available. So. Um, oh. And uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't mention um, Sm Snowball Edge um, with GPU now. So a lot of you are using Snowballs, you know, they get content uh, from your archives back to um, AWS and, and S3 so that you can process it further. Um, we're continually having conversations with folks that want to have more compute at the edge. So we had Lambda at the edge, and now we can run a full AMI at the edge. And now with GPU uh, capability within some of these snowballs, we can do even more high performance you know, visualization, possibly machine wor learning workloads that would need a GPU um, enabled on there. So again, being able to maybe pre-position a snowball at an event at the edge, use that to not only capture dailies, but also possibly backhaul um, and pre-tag uh, or, or visualize assets before they come back to AWS from that perspective. And uh, you know, we're gonna have some more ideas around how this fits in um, here in the near future as well. So in, in kind of um, coming full circle on our conversation of how to get you know, media back to AWS so that we can continue to process it, we know this is a challenge for a lot of customers. We've got two more new services to, to chat about. One, as much as it pains me to say so, and much as it you know, probably pains a lot of your IT security folks, FTP is still reality in a lot of shops today. So we now have a secure FTP as a service. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be a secure way for you to kind of quickly set up and manage you know, FTP and be able to still provide you know, that level of access um, to uh, some of your content producers and partners and folks in the field to get stuff back to AWS. But the one I think is uh, even more exciting is AWS Data Sync. So as the name would suggest, this is bi-directional um, accelerated uh, data acceleration to and from the cloud. Uh, so whether you're using it in a single direction, whether you're using it to fan out and, and synchronize data to multiple different silos, um, you could even use this internal um, on some of your data silos that may be parked both on-prem and in AWS in the sense that we have a lot of customers who have mentioned to us, hey, we're running you know, a half dozen, if not dozen MAM or DAM systems within our organization. Each of those data silos you know, is, uh, we would like to synchronize the metadata and the data between some of those. Um, and uh, also, how do we get data from on-prem to the cloud and back again, just as part of the workloads that we're, we're working on today. So um, it, AWS Data Sync is a great fit for that. It does win acceleration. Like most of our other services, it's as a service. So you guys only pay for what you use from that perspective. Um, and today, uh, you know, the, the on-prem uh, version of this uh, is deployed as a, as a VMware image um, that connects to NFS, uh, but we are working on other versions and flavors of this that will support, say, SIFs and, and, and other share types as well as other deployment models. Um, so we'd love to hear your feedback as to what you guys need so that we can kind of continue to, to drive that roadmap. So AWS Outposts, you know, from one perspective, you can think of it as Snowball's big brother that's more permanent, right? Um, but uh, again, a lot of folks are, are challenged with whether they're going all in on the cloud, or whether they're looking at a hybrid approach, um, that there's going to be levels of infrastructure that they want to run at the edge, whether that be in an existing data center, um, and you want to be able to use AWS uh, or VMware technology on AWS hardware in that data center and extend the cloud kind of into the data center uh, naturally that way, or whether or not, as a media production professional, you need larger chunks of compute at the edge and want to deploy you know, a quarter rack or a half rack worth of infrastructure from AWS um, for maybe you know, a production that's taking six months somewhere and, and you guys uh, want to be able to run virtual workstations with GPUs or you want to be able to do machine learning and, and tagging you know, at the edge from that perspective. So um, I think there'll be a lot of different ways that this will fit. Uh, we're also still, I think, uh, learning from customers how you want to uh, purchase this or deploy this. So again, looking for feedback from, from you folks there. But 
Um, the idea is this will be the same AWS servers and infrastructures that we use in our regions available to customers to run uh, at the edge or in your data centers. And you'll be able to pick from a native AWS environment running you know, AWS Linux and, and things like RDS and, and some of the tools that you're familiar with today and deploying you know, EC2 on these, as well as you know, if you're a VMware shop and you want to run VMware on there, um, do the AWS's tight partnership with VMware, that's another opportunity as well. So, so <clears throat> I mentioned uh, at the beginning of our conversation that we would think about um, AI and ML and, and where it's fitting into some of the conversations that we're having and how we're thinking about this at, at AWS. So we've had SageMaker for a bit over a year now. We've extended that uh, with a new version called SageMaker Ground Truth, which is essentially bringing um, humans into the mix to help train the model and, and make the, the model more accurate. So, you know, if we're talking about tagging metadata uh, and you guys have created the custom model on SageMaker, um, but you've been able to achieve, let's say, 80% accuracy with, with your tags, but due to compliance reasons, due to business reasons, you need to get tighter than that. Um, we're now able, whether it's a private workforce or a public workforce, to so think through uh, our Automatic Turk uh, group, be able to add humans uh, to uh, the tagging process to kind of uh, help that model become more accurate over time uh, and improve um, how quickly we can tag, or I'm sorry, improve how quickly we can train a more accurate model or create a more accurate model uh, within your teams. Um, I think the other place that this gets interesting, and I spent some time earlier in my career at AWS on the marketplace team, is we talk about custom models, and you know we've got a lot of API-driven cognitive tools like recognition and transcribe and translate, and we're doing a lot with those. We're going to talk about some solutions here in a minute that are based on um, some of those solutions. But uh, we all know that, that there may be things beyond what those solutions can do today that are really unique to your business and would require a unique uh, model at that point. And whether or not you come to us or one of our partners to help build that model, whether you have the expertise and the agility internally to create that model yourselves, or the third option that we now have is the AWS Marketplace for Machine Learning, where a lot of our machine learning uh, partners uh, like uh, Veritone that we have um, uh, here uh, with us today, you know, are selling their machine learning models um, uh, for use on Marketplace, and you guys can go and, and look at a curated catalog that uh, are designed to work today with SageMaker and be able to deploy them quickly. Um, the other one that I think a lot of folks in this room are excited about, myself included, is Amazon Personalized. You know, as, as a consumer of video, I've got young kids. You know, I've been a cord cutter for eight years, so I was kind of early, you know, maybe on the trend there. Um, I'm watching a lot of, you know, my video today streaming, and I think the minimum bar that's expected from our uh, customers, our mutual end customer, right, um, your end customers, is uh, a great user experience. You know, they want a curated experience. They want to be able to find the content that's relevant to them. They want recommendations about new things to watch. And you may have a hit show, and we don't want to just get into the popularity um, scenario where we're only telling people about, you know, what the next, you know, hit show is that's out there. I think that's great, and we should do some of that. But additionally, what we really want to do is drive personalization to our customers because that builds value, and that value then helps us, you know, uh, ensure that, you know, as maybe that hit show is coming to an end, that we're not going to have churn on our platform and that we're finding other content that's relevant to that subscriber and getting it in front of them so they keep them on the, on the platform. Um, so I think there's two sides to this. I think that there's a really interesting side where, um, you know, we're driving a deeper relationship with our customer by making recommendations. We're building a great, rich uh, end user experience. And that's what customers uh, are asking for, are really demanding, you know, from that perspective. But secondarily, there's a lot of lessons and, and data that we can use as well from this to also help us drive our businesses. This is, hey, you know, maybe the, um, uh, females 18 to 25 really like, you know, cop drama. So, you know, we should go out and either create net new content or find the rights to new content, you know, for more cop dramas to, again, keep the, the target demographics that are most important to us within our platforms happy with new and fresh content and then also bring that discoverability to that content so that they can find it and consume it and continue to be subscribers um, that are happy on the platform from that perspective. So Amazon Personalized is the way to do that. I think it's also interesting to a lot of us in the room around more of an omni-channel marketing and sales perspective as well. So while we talk a lot about 
you know, recommendations for VOD platforms and thing like, things like that on here. We're also looking at um, a lot of you may have some sort of, you know, e-commerce partner or e-commerce site where, you know, if I'm a sports, you know, league, not only do I want to make sure that my favorite team and my favorite players, uh, maybe their highlights and clips are being shown to me in, in my sports portal so I can watch the highlights from, from last night if I missed it, or over the water cooler, talk to my buddy about like, oh, did you see this play by LeBron last night? But I should also then be recommended LeBron's jersey, LeBron's, you know, um, shoes, you know, whatever else, you know, we may have in our arsenal that we want to put in front of, you know, a customer to enrich, enrich their experience, but also help find new avenues to drive revenue, you know, within our businesses. You can also drive engagement this way. Yep. And one of the ways, uh, sports is really uh, interesting because it's high value content, but from an ML perspective, it's also very uh, uh, structured. So you can, uh, you know, you've got players running around with numbers on their jerseys. There's a scoreboard that you can look at. Uh, so we've done uh, demos. There's a one out in the, I think we're showing it here, uh, that it's a minor league hockey game that will, uh, we have a model that's watching the scoreboard. And then when the scoreboard changes, we will clip out um, the previous 30 seconds of, or 20 seconds, you can set it up however you want, uh, of video that you could then push to fans and say, hey, something cool just happened, check it out. Um, so sports is a great example where you can apply machine learning uh, to improve customer engagement um, by showing them things that are exciting and um, interesting. Yeah, I think the, the one other use case I'll mention, and we're kind of still early days around looking at how this would work and is it relevant to you folks in terms of driving your business outcomes, is as we move these, these media archives to the cloud, we're using machine learning to enrich the metadata tags that, you know, and supplement the metadata tags, because we all know that the majority of us in our room may not have tagged media in our asset management systems or our CMSs as well as we could have the first time. So we can add additional value um, to those assets as we run machine learning on them as they come to the cloud. But I think the other side of that to look at is how to recommend and personalize the search experience for our own producers and editors and content creators within our business and whether or not we could use something like personalize to basically say, hey, I'm doing a documentary about X, Y, and Z. You know, here are some of the clips I've already selected. Can you go and find more clips like this um, so that I don't have to spend, you know, six weeks in front of the search pane in my asset management system searching for this? Then maybe we can use machine learning to help us on these topics, you know. So if I'm doing, um, you know, some sort of uh, documentary that, you know, it's going to come back and say, like, you picked, you know, four clips of Martin Luther King. Here's... 15 other clips we found in our, our catalog that are similar in, in sentiment and vibe you know, to those. Are they relevant you know, to you in terms of your documentary and, and help kind of discover stuff that's in the archive and present it forward? So the last topic that, that um, Alex and I will talk to you about today is our media solutions. Um, we've put a lot of time and effort into these. And you know, there's different places we feel like these fit. You know, one of them is just conversation starters. A lot of folks understand our building blocks, but they're like, how do we get started on these? Where do they fit? Um, even if it's not something you're gonna use out of the box as an end-to-end -end solution, it's a great example of how to build a well-architected, many times serverless solution on AWS and kind of understand how to kind of quickly get the POC with these um, or use them as, a, as kind of a reference architecture to build something larger. Or maybe depending on your use case, it fits you know, perfect the first time and, and you can kind of just run with it and, and iterate it on a little bit. Um, are, I think of these as recipes that yeah. kind of get you started, and uh, you can take them and change them. Um, but they're they're not a a service per se, but rather a collection of services configured in a uh, you know a, a, a way that we know you can deploy with one click. That you can have confidence that they're well architected. You can add to them and change them. Um, but it's a recipe that gets it makes it easy for you to get started. Yeah, that's a great point, Alex. And um, I think secondarily, it's also you know. We're not trying to build solutions like our partners. Their, their solutions are always going to be richer, but there's, there's kind of a layer between, you know, what we, even as we build more and more services that go higher in our stack, you know, um, you know there's still going to be ways for us to, to take and kind of blend these together in a way that's easy for um, you, our customer, to, to consume from that perspective. So we're going to go through a couple of them today. Um, so we've got the media analysis solution. So this was kind of our first... Uh, machine learning um, service that collects, you know, things like recognition, sediment analysis with Comprehend, um, uh, speech-to-text translation, 
and allows folks to kind of use it, uh, use these services very quickly uh, and deploy either adding it to something like um, your asset management database or um, VOD uh, archives that you may have and, and be able to pull metadata out of those clips from that perspective. And then we kind of extended this with this idea of Media Cloud, which again includes the sentiment, uh, I'm sorry, includes this metadata extraction and identification, but now adds things like being able to hand that metadata back off to your uh, incumbent MAM or DAM vendor. So this is where we're starting to mix some of our partners into here, whether that partner helps us accelerate getting media into the cloud, or secondarily, um, we've extracted the metadata and now we want to hand it off to you know, your MAM or DAM uh, incumbent partner, whether they be on-prem or in the cloud. Um, we've got both a live streaming uh, for OTT and the VOD solution. These are, uh, again, both built you know, um, on the Elemental uh, platform as well. Uh, our Media Services Application Manager, which is actually kind of a, a dashboard to help you whether you're running a, um, really any of the Elemental services, but in particular if you're running some sort of you know, VOD delivery pipeline or whether you're running a, a live OTT broadcast and you want to get kind of a dashboard as to like what's happening under the hood of the services, this is a great way to kind of deploy that as well. What, what that does is it will also show the dependencies between different solu uh, solutions. So if you have a uh, Media Connect flow feeding a media live encoder, feeding media package, feeding CloudFront, you can use the um, um, media services application mapper to see how those um, different uh, individual primitives fit together as part of an overall workflow. Yeah, and then uh, um, we've, uh, we've taken one of the demos that we've shown, I think a lot of you may have seen it at IBC or NAB, um, but it's our automated uh, subtitling with multi-language um, translation uh, built into it. So uh, that is something that we have now um, rolled into a solution and that we are announcing today will be available in the next week or so uh, as a solution that you guys can download and deploy, whether that be for uh, VOD assets um, or whether that be for live linear OTT, you can use this to start adding um, machine learning subtitling and even translation uh, to those workloads uh, in the way that's uh, kind of a one-click deploy from a solution perspective. So this under the hood uses Amazon Transcribe to produce the caption files and then translate to produce the different languages. Um, it is a, a starting point. Um, I actually got to use a earlier version of this uh, for one of my internal presentations. Um, I give presentations to my own team. Um, and it was a lot of fun because we took me speaking live in English uh, use this solution to create multi-language captions and then the team who was doing it actually set it up one step further where they had uh, Poly, which is our text-to-speech service, um, uh, creating alternate audio tracks in different languages. So you could actually in your player toggle uh, the audio track and you could see me speaking natively in English um, or spe see me speaking in German or in French or in Spanish. Um, I, think, I think they did a few more too. Um, and um, all without any uh, human translators or human um, uh, stenographers, uh, all using our machine learning services. Yeah. Question? Just on that point, you guys have... Yeah, Matt. What's your talk to the latency between sound and screen on that? It was not too bad. I, I didn't have a stopwatch out, so it was tens of seconds. Um, it, it was not, you know, we, we have lower latency options that you can build on AWS and this was not one of them, um, but uh, it was certainly not, you know, a, a VOD-like experience. This was live, um, and um, yeah. I was going to say. Sorry, you the can, question can, was the question was how much latency was introduced. If, if you want to. Yeah. But here's the beautiful part. In a week or less, you'll be able to go and download this and try it in your own environment. And then, you know, we love to get feedback. You know, if, if you need less latency, you know, where, where, where do we need to fill the gaps from that perspective? But we're really excited to see what you guys build with this and, and uh, what, you, what you all think. So, yep. So if you're looking to try these solutions, you go to the AWS Answers page, for slash solution, and select Media Entertainment, and that will show you all the solutions there. Or just reach out to your account manager or one of us on the m and &E team, and we'll make sure you find them from that perspective. So... So just to kind of show you a little bit about how these were built, um, you know, here's the architecture for media analysis solutions. So we're picking files up from an S3 bucket, 
running it through the various cognitive uh, API-driven solutions, things like recognition, transcribe, sentiment analysis, and then delivering um, you know, the metadata tags we've extracted from that back out um, uh, to S3 or to, to your analytical pane. The next step would be, say, media to cloud. This is where we can then create a metadata sidecar to pass off to your asset management platform. We're happy to integrate with any of your asset management platforms, or if you've built something homegrown, we're happy to show you how to integrate into that as well so we can hand off a metadata sidecar, or if you can read directly out of DynamoDB where we're saving the metadata, that's a good place as well. But this is also a solution that we're looking to kind of, and we'd love to get feedback on this. You know, we have a lot of customers who have multiple different MAMs. We're looking for kind of one source of truth in terms of having different MAMs kind of pull metadata from a, from a central area. We're also looking at, you know, what does metadata redundancy look like, you know, in the cloud from a DR strategy perspective. Um, and then finally, you know, your, your current incumbent MAM or DAM, you know, you may be looking for, to replace that for business reasons in the future. So this would also be an area where we would have a complete metadata record of, of all the metadata and be able to do like a bulk update to a new partner that you're bringing on board, you know, from that perspective. Um, so that's media to cloud. Uh, I mentioned before we have both an OTT live streaming as well as a video on demand solution. Um, again, these are all serverless. They, they feature a lot of the elemental components. And then you can add things like you know, DRM, you know, using some of our partners with the, uh, the Speak API. Uh, many of these are available on the AWS Marketplace. Uh, you may want to add a file QC partner to some of this as well. Um, OTT, you know, analytics, stuff like that. Um, and then uh, the, the new multi-language subtitling solution I mentioned today, and this is how it's architected as well here. Uh, and we've got Chris Couton with us who, uh, who leads our solutions team. So find us you know, during one of the breaks, and we're, we're happy to kind of dive deeper into some of those you know, discussions or, or even do a, a demo if you'd like. But again, the best demo is these are all one-click deploys. All the code's available for you to, to check it out and iterate on it. So just download it and get started with it, I think is... is you know, our message to you from that perspective, so. So finally, I think the last thing we'll mention here, um, and then uh, we've got our next presenter that'll be coming up, is a lot, of, uh, a lot of what we're iterating on, a lot of fresh demos will be at NAB this year, so we're just a few weeks away from NAB. Love to have you folks join us in the booth, you know, uh, talk to your account managers about uh, finding time, you know, for an official meeting, but we're going to have a lot of our partner demo pods, a lot of these media solutions, as well as a number of new demonstrations you haven't seen before at NAB. Uh, so please uh, find time in your busy schedules to stop by and visit us uh, out in Las Vegas. And we'd love to show you uh, the absolute uh, latest and greatest uh, solutions uh, that we've been working on. Great. Uh, well, with that, I think we're going to turn it over to Steph from uh, CBS Sports Digital, who's going to take you through some of their experiences streaming large events at scale. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Aaron.